Dear uh, guests, friends and colleagues, my great pleasure to welcome you to uh, Robert Blumberg Distinguished Lecture in Cognitive Science 2018. Let me tell you a couple of words about this idea. Um, some time ago, um, Robert Blumberg, the Honorary Council of Rep Republic of Latvia in Illinois, on the other hand, and uh, some of uh, COGSI colleagues, uh, Mike Blumberg, Laurie Newcomb, Larry Moss, and a couple of other colleagues, we were discussing the idea to establish um, an annual honorary lecture that is um, assigned to somebody who has significantly shaped the interdisciplinary field of uh, cognitive science. And the idea is that the uh, University of Latvia uh, would be the right place, really would be the right place to honor uh, that kind of person. Uh, and uh, especially important is it is because there are no similar lectures or no similar events in uh, Baltic area, and there are also no similar events in uh, Eastern Europe. And um, uh, 2018, our uh, selection of 2018 is Robert Galson from the University of uh, Bloomington. And um, uh, this lecture is, as I mentioned before, made possible because of uh, donation uh, by Robert Bloomberg, uh, who is uh, um, Honorary Council of uh, Latvia in um, Chicago. Uh, but this is not only a financial uh, support. Uh, Rob was always uh, uh, interested in the event and has always supported us also morally and I think um, it's also a, a, a great present to Latvia 100th anniversary as a, as a kind of a nice uh, continuous event that we will have every year every um, uh, year as a, as a, as a honorary um, lecture in respect to a, a significant uh, expert in cognitive science. Um, and I'm, I'm so glad that Robert is with us here, and I would like to uh, ask uh, to, to, to say a couple of words, uh, and, and um, then I will say a couple of words about uh, our um, recipient. Thank you, Jurgi. Um, yeah, it's a great honor, uh, I guess, to have my name associated with this uh, lecture series. Uh, as some of you already know, I'm very proud of Jurgis, uh, what he's done in this field here for Latvia and in the Baltics, and he's really a leading figure. So anything I can do to support him and to support the university, um, I want to do that. And like Jurgis said, I, I feel I'm a lawyer, and I don't know that much about the cognitive sciences area, but I know it's a very important area. Um, it was interesting, I had read recently that you know, even with the commercial aspects of it, um, like a lot of those Silicon Valley people, um, like the founder of Instagram and the founder of LinkedIn, they were cognitive sciences people at Stanford, I guess, like their symbolic systems major. Um, and so it's a very important field. And as I said this morning, probably more importantly, that you experts help, you know, help people, help, help us think. and. Um, help solve problems uh, in, the, in the mental health field too, so I think that's very important. Uh, anyway, so I'm really proud to support the university and to support Jurgis's efforts and to support your field in some little way. Thank you. Thank you so much. <clears throat> and um, well, now, let me say a couple of words about uh, Robert Goldstone, our 2018 uh, uh, Distinguished Lecturer in Cognitive Science. Uh, Robert Goldstone is Chancellor's Professor and Distinguished Professor at the Department of Psychological and Brain Science in the in, in Indiana University in Bloomington. Um, Robert's uh, work uh, is mainly on areas of perceptual learning, concept learning, and uh, uh, categorization. He has done also a lot of work on computation and modeling of cognition, neural networks, collective problem solving. And uh, if we think about uh, uh, areas like categorization or perceptual learning, we, we cannot think of uh, 2018 field without uh, um, Rob Goldstone's uh, efforts. Uh, and I'm also um, uh, happy to say that um, um, Robert was also a part of um, um, 
um, well, our uh, rigorous co cognitive science, so, well, so international community network. We were frequently in inter interaction, and, and I'm, I'm very happy that um, our collaboration continues. And uh, yeah, well, Professor Golson is also a member of American a Academy of Sciences, and um, uh, it's my great pleasure and honor to, to give the floor to our um, 2018 Robert Bloomberg Distinguished Lecturer, Robert Goldstone. You're welcome. Well, it's a real honor and privilege to be here. Um, I should thank Jurgis for bringing us all together. Um, amazing job with this all. Um, also, I'd like to thank Robert Bloomberg um, for his support, for his generosity, uh, not least of which is his generosity in his time for being here. <laughs> thank you very much. Um, and thank all the rest of you for staying awake, for being here. Um, yeah, it's been a long, fulfilling, very worthwhile day, but it has been a long day. Um, so I would like to talk about work that I've been doing with um, Francisco Laradamer and Doug Hofstadter for a long, long time. This has been um, 10 years and more uh, as a project in the making, um, um, and it's very likely an infinite project. Um, and I guess we haven't made all that much work progress on it, less than 20% the way there. Well, I guess 20% of infinity is still a very large non-number. Um, and so I faced the problem, if I ever wanted to talk about this stuff, um, I should talk about it anyway, even knowing that it's in a, a very sad state of completion. Um, what is of interest to us, um, I, I hope to eventually be able to um, explain away this, this uh, awful title <laughs> um, and say why would somebody be in, in engaged in that enterprise. Of course, if you're going to be working with Doug Hofstadter, you have to be willing to engage in some amount of um, meta and meta meta analytic thinking. But um, our, our point for departure is we wanted to have a, a model of scientific discovery, um, perhaps eventually of the kind made by scientists, as Professor Michael Glansberg was, is Michael somewhere here, was talking about er earlier today, um, but maybe more immediately, we're interested in a model of students, um, because students are oftentimes interacting with simulations, with natural phenomena and simulations of those phenomena, and we like to have an understanding of how they're interpreting the world they're seeing around them. Um, and our particular perspective is very much uh, shaped by the, the famous philosopher of, sci of science, uh, Thomas Kuhn, and um, a nice quote that's famous from Kuhn is, during revolutions, scientists see new and different things when looking with familiar instruments in places they have looked before. What were ducks in the scientist's world before the revolution are rabbits afterwards. He's making an allusion to Ludwig Wittgenstein's famous popularization of that Jastro perceptual illusion that's ambiguous, can be interpreted as either ducks or, or as rabbits. And we're very much interested in the kinds of perceptual change that an expert or a more knowledgeable scientist will have. Um, and so going along with uh, Kuhn's analysis, his point is that Aristotle um, and Galileo, uh, Michael already mentioned Galileo today, really were looking at different phenomena, seeing different phenomena, when they were both seeing this pendulum swinging in the sand. So for Aristotle, what he would be really seeing is an object that in some senses wants to be lower and wants to be at a settled point down low and it's taking a while to get to that low point. So some of the things that he would be very likely to notice, to perceive, is the weight of the load, the vertical height to which it had been raised and the time that it takes 
And the idea is he's thinking of it slowly getting to, to where it wants to be. Whereas for Galileo, he's really thinking of this as part of a circle. And if it were frictionless, then it would keep on swinging back and forth ad infinitum. So for him, there's very different things he's noticing, like the angular displacement, the time per swing. And he's seeing it as um, a pendulum that's almost going exactly repeating the same motion again and again. So this is, um, I think, a very deep and, to me, uh, an insightful connection that Kuhn was making to science and perception, which in some ways I believe has been lost somewhat in the intervening years. So I, I don't really want to pick on somebody, but I guess if I'm picking on somebody, I'd go high. Um, so um, I'm going to associate the kinds of models I'm going to be talking about with Herb Simon, who is a Nobel Prize winner in economics, but really, that was just a guise. He did his work in cognitive science, and that's what he won his Nobel Prize for. Um, and he and his students engage in years and years of work on computational models of scientific discovery. Um, one of them that I'm showing here is Bacon, and it is, among many other facts, it's discovering on its own Kepler's third law, which is the square of the orbital period of a planet is proportional to the cube of the semi-major axis of its orbit. Okay, you don't have to process that. I'll, uh, some of the uh, physicists, uh, you will recognize that. Um, what? happens, though, if you sort of scratch under the surface of Bacon, is that Bacon is taking as input a table of, of critical variables. It's given, importantly, distance and period for a set of um, nine planets, I guess eight now. Um, and what Bacon is going to do in coming up with Kepler's law itself is it's going to entertain different kinds of relations between the distance of a planet to its period around the sun. And it will originally consider perhaps uh, a square relation, realize that that's off um, perhaps a cubic relation, and then eventually if it comes up with this idea through arithmetic transformations of cubing the distance, dividing it by the period square, it will come up with an answer which is constant. And that is a statement of, of Kepler's third law. So um, some of the heuristics that go into a model of scientific discovery like Bacon are to try to detect covariances between variables and create new functions, new transformations of those variables in order to try to find something which will be an invariant. And so there's just heuristics, try a square relation, try a cubic relation, divide one of these relations by the other relation, and eventually it will be able to get there. Um, another thing that it tries to do is generalize by varying the independent variables that were held constant at a lower level. So, for example, one of the things it discovers is the ideal gas law, which is PV equals NRT, the pressure times the volume of these ideal gas that uh, Michael again was talking about earlier today, equals uh, a, a constant N um, times the temperature um, times the number of molecules. Right? So that is the ideal gas law in its full glory. But um, to get there, you can try to keep constant some things like temperature and just try to find the relation between the volume and the pressure. And once you found that relation, then you can try to introduce um, what was held constant before. And that's how you get more and more general laws within the world of Bacon. Okay, so I've just given you a whirlwind tour of, of, of a, a, a model that's actually a lot more complex, but I think that suffices to give you a flavor for it. And um, I have to say that what it's able to do is far more impressive than what we're able to do in terms of just counting the number of laws that, that it wins on. Um, so this has been applied to Archimedes' law, Snell's law of refraction, Black's specific heat law, et cetera. So um, it is going be able to handle far more situations than our system is going to, but we'd like to think that 
we're not cheating so much. <laughs> um, so now on the, the critical aspect of this is that, you know, there's a huge amount of intellectual work which is being done by models like Bacon by deciding what will be the variables that you're going to enter into your table and you're going to try to find the transformations of. And this point has been made in um, an important paper by Dave Chalmers, Bob French, and Doug Hofstadter earlier. Um, there's a sense in which you're doing a lot of work because you're feeding in these pre-digested numeric representations for the variables. So, you know, there was nobody telling Kepler, hmm, you know, maybe you should consider relating distance to period. He had to come up with that very idea himself, right? Which is not trivial. Um, so what I would like to argue is, um, putting it more politely, that they, these models are finessing, to put it less politely, they're ignoring <laughs> um, the challenges of perception of a, of a rich world that is intervening in multiple open-ended numbers of ways. And these pictures on the side are just trying to convey um, the complexity of the world. So um, this is a mitochondria, um, which took years and years for microscopists and biologists to discover, even when they had a microscope that had sufficient resolution in order to see mitochondria, they still didn't see the mitochondria because they were unexpected. Um, I've painted in red what is the boundary around the mitochondria, and believe me, if I took away that red boundary, it would be very difficult for you to, to see what is the designation for the mitochondria. Or you guys all are way more informed about language than I am, but I've taken um, a spectrogram of a sentence here, and it is notoriously difficult to find where are the word segment boundaries, which I'm showing in red here. So the world does not come pre-digested. Um, it doesn't come wearing its perceptual representation on sleeves. That is a, a major intellectual achievement to get. So um, what our enterprise now, going back to the title, is we're interested in building a computational model of how, say, a student, not so much a scientist, might perceive and interpret natural phenomena. Um, very often these days, especially given uh, the um, stressed budgets of American schools, these are oftentimes virtual laboratories rather than physical laboratories of, of natural phenomena, which is why we're interested in the, the computer models of natural phenomena that students are exposed to. So um, on the positive side, uh, people like Tonda Young and Marshall Lin have shown that these virtual simulated laboratories are often as effective as physical laboratories for engaging students in open-ended discovery learning and semi-discovery directed learning. Um, another reason why we're interested in this as a question is because they allow us to demonstrate how a learner could go from a perceptual representation to a conceptual interpretation, doing what Melanie Mitchell has called crossing the semantic gap from perception to semantics. Um, we are interested very much so in predicting how students will interpret simulations so we can better design these simulations. All too often, they're going to be misinterpreting these simulations. And there's many cases where there's well-known misinterpretations that students are likely to run into when they're engaged in simulations of heat transfer, evolution, diffusion, specialization, uh, one obvious one. Um, if you drop a bit of ink in a glass of water, um, you see the ink will spread out, and many students will assume that each one of these ink molecules has a tendency to go from the high gradient to the low gradient of ink. They think that these ink molecules are, are moving outwards, whereas if you looked in on any one of these ink molecules, it's engaged in a Brownian motion, a complete random motion. Macroscopically, the ink looks like it's spreading out, but that is despite each individual ink molecule not having any privileged direction of motion at all. 
Um, so that would be the, the kind of misinterpretation that we would like to be able to identify in our students and then hopefully correct by creating better pedagogical simulations. So you can think of what we're doing as trying to create uh, quality control for the simulations. Before we unleash the simulation on real students, we'd like to test it out on our model of students to see if there's going to be likely misinterpretations of it. Right. So we would like to engage in automated tutoring with the simulations. Um, maybe this isn't great uh, because we're not even close to being there, but maybe as a, a model of scientific reasoning. Real scientists are tricky and they do all kinds of things that we are not going to be modeling here. Um, what, what can I say? This will not be a, a true model of a, a scientist. Um, on the other hand, most scientists were at one point in their lives children. So we're, they're modeling maybe this, this idea of what is a good um, student's knowledge of these simulations and their interpretations um, as something that might create the, the beginnings of a scientist. So our core commitments in our model, which is called NINSUN, which stands for something if you need that, um, it is also uh, the Sumerian goddess who was famously Gilgamesh's mother and interpreter of his dreams. Um, and so our, our core commitments are, we wanted to start with a relatively perceptually grounded input. We did, don't want to do what I was saying um, Bacon was doing in terms of cheating by giving it these tables of periods and distances. We want in our system the ability for the model to engage in this scientific practice of experimental intervention. We want it so that the observer can change the world and then see how the change that they're making are going to influence whatever they're recording from their perceptual systems. And a big part of what we're interested in is trying to establish human cognitively plausible heuristics for determining relations among simulations elements. And so here I think there's a strong connection between what we're doing and what uh, James uh, put it Piyavsky was just doing. So we're both interested in this grounding aspect, and we're interested in some ways in grounding our system using human-like constraints. So yes, in terms of what Robert Blumberg was saying, yeah, there are going to be uh, lucrative applications of cognitive science. We're not interested in creating something that creates scientific discoveries way better than scientists do, but we'll make our millions instead by trying to, to train the next generation of scientists. In that sense, we would like to know about the same kinds of fallacies, misinterpretations that students will make, All right? So educational millions. Say. Okay, so here is um, the architecture for Ninsun, and um, in accordance with truth in advertising laws from the Federal Trade Commission, I'm forced to say that um, there's a lot of things here that are red. So, um, and I guess it's even worse. The things that I've, I've said are green, which are implemented, should not be taken to mean that they're fully implemented or that we're not going back and making changes to these systems. But um, the things in green are, there's some implementation. The things in yellow have some very partial implementation. And we've got ideas about the things in red, but none of them have been implemented. So the overall flow of Ninsun is to have first a way of expressing models in nature. And so that's the thing on the far left. We have to have a, a, a world creator. And then um, the thing that I'm going to be mostly talking about today is the inspector, the thing which looks at the world and tries to perceive new elements from that world. And from there, um, it's going to get 
its perception sent to something that's going to propose laws, and this law proposer is going to be connecting with this completely non-existent model constructor, which is particularly painful to me to admit because I'm a cognitive scientist, I believe in models, and also because you know Professor Glansberg is exactly right. That's where the real action is. Um, so this law proposer, though, for us, will be connected to something which is actually intervening experiments. So on the basis of the laws that it's conjecturing, it'll say, hmm, it would be really good to get evidence on this. And to manipulate the world, then the intervening experiments part is going to go back to the, the visual spatial simulator. OK, so now in, in terms of this inspector, um, what I wanted to point out is that the model does not begin with this notion of a persistent object, right? So you might see Jurgis at one moment and then see him ag again. And it is our contention that it is an intellectual achievement to realize that there's not two Jurgis twins going around. That a, a parsimonious by Occam's razor interpretation is it's the same Jurgis, all right? Um, he's even, even though he's moving his chin um, from, from moment to moment in a, in a confusing way. Um, so, um, so until the model has this notion of persisting objects, it can't understand what speed is. Speed is derivative on persisting objects. You can't know that this object is moving fast until you realize it's the same object, just displaced in space. And until you've dis decided that you have speed for objects, you can't understand this notion of direction, right? And until you have this notion of direction, you can't understand this notion of like collisions or attraction, because what it means to detect for us a collision is that there is a sudden change in the direction and the speed of one object based upon the presence of another object. So you get this building up of perceptual features rather than just like saying, here's the distance, right? Um, and so our notion of pressure is going to be very much a built up notion compared to how it was in Bacon. So Bacon did discover the ideal gas laws, but it was because pressure was given to it as an atomic notion. Right? Whereas for us, pressure is going to be something like the number of collisions of these ideal gas molecules against the side wall of the containing vessel. Right? And so that's a built up notion of pressure, but we think it's much more grounded in the, in the same sense that I think James was getting at. So that's what our model does. I should, you know, again, to be honest, I should say what we're giving to it and what it's deriving. Because um, we are giving to it uh, at least one higher level of representation than what some people in computer vision would be giving their systems. We are not handling the figure ground or the contour segmentation problem. We are already giving our model elementary objects that have size, shape, positions and colors. We believe that the existing uh, work in computer vision would allow us to n finesse that. So we could use those models as the front ends for our models. But w so this is where we're starting. But what uh, Ninsun does derive are all of the rest of these kinds of perceptual features. Okay, so I'm not going to be able to describe the whole system. I thought I would describe just one piece of it because I think it's um, comprehensible. And what I'm first getting at here is this notion of persisting objects. So many of you are now seeing um, two objects, what? I don't know, going up and down or going left and right? Right? Um, it's, I don't know. It's, it'll probably be a mix of you. If you see them going up and down and you want to see them going left and right, then I guess one thing you could do is hide half of them, hide the ones on the right side, and then gradually bring them into your view, and then you'll be able to see them going up and down. And vice versa, if you want to see them going left and right, then hide the bottom 
balls and then gradually bring them in and then you'll be able to see it going left and right. So it, you know, it's, an, it's a classic, very, very simple, ambiguous display, right? Um, and the point here is that we don't want to start with a system that already has the motions. We want it to create that. So we are going to be building on the work of Michael Dawson, Shimon Ullman, in terms of a neural network for apparent motion perception. Um, and so to go over it rather fast, we have, let's say we have three objects in one frame, one snapshot, and then we'll have three objects in the next snapshot. What we will create in terms of our neural network is n squared, where n was the number of objects we saw, we'll have n squared units, node neurons, um, that are each going to represent a hypothesis that one of the objects in one frame corresponds to one of the objects in the other frame. So there will be, for example, this unit that says, I think the top yellow dot from frame one corresponds to the top blue circle from frame two, okay? And so there will be n squared of these because everybody could correspond to everybody else. And so from this, we just incorporate certain um, psychological constraints of color and location similarity. So for example, we're going to send a little bit of extra activation to this neuron because both of these circles are blue. So the unit that says that those correspond to each other will get a little bit more excited because they're both blue and because they are also in the same location. So those are two types of similarity that will influence things. We also have this idea of consistency between nodes. So um, this node that I'll call B says that blue circle corresponds with this yellow circle. And that node is completely harmonious with this node A that says uh, that yellow circle corresponds to this blue circle. Why are they harmonious? Because they result in consistent one-to-one -one mappings in contrast to um, these two units A and B that are going to be mutually antagonistic. So if this yellow circle corresponds to this blue circle, then it better not also correspond with this yellow circle here because that would be polygamy. All right. So we have these monogamous relations. What, what polygamy really would correspond to is this idea of, of objects spontaneously coming into and out of existence. So if we can avoid an interpretation of that, then we, then we do. Okay, so that's a kind of constraint that we're putting in. We also put in um, sort of motion constraints. This is just our... Um, innovation. We want things to be moving in the same direction that they were moving before. So you tend to get facilitation of a, of a neuron if the direction that an object's previous motion was is similar to its next direction. And I think I can demonstrate that really easily for you psychologically. So um, what do you see? So presumably you all saw horizontal motion there. Even though the last two frames are exactly the frames that I was showing to you before. And so this is how we're incorporating inertia. And I can bias you vertically, so you are now all seeing vertical motion, right? So this inertial constraint is important. And so that's how that comes about. So now going up a level, where, where do these feed into? Well. So here's an example of detecting a relation between two elemental units, between like two balls that are um, knocking into each other that are like these billiard balls of an ideal gas. Um, so the psychological constraints that we're putting in are things like um, you'll believe that there's a collision between um, two balls if you have a potential collider which is close and um, if it can explain the change of speed and direction of the ball that you see and you can compare it to the expected direction that you would get and if those are similar to each other you'll be even more sure that there's a collision and another constraint that we need to fit 
human psycholo psychology is if you're seeing a whole bunch of other collisions, then you'll tend to interpret this as a collision. Whereas if you're seeing a whole bunch of other passing through events, you'll also interpret this as a passing through. Um, and I think I can, I can show you this actually um, as a, on the psychology side. So here's a whole bunch of balls moving back. Um, you can see where my arrow is pointing on the cursor. I want you to pay attention to those red dots. And um, how would you characterize, there is a correct answer to this. Um, do you think that those are passing through each other or do you think they're colliding with each other and bouncing off of each other? How many people say pass through? How many people say collide? Okay, yeah, the majority is right. So this is a collision. I'll show you how hard it is. Um, I've just made them so they pass through each other. So it's a difficult judgment. So they are now passing through each other rather than bouncing off of each other. So that was a pass through. Here, I'll change the color, that'll make it easier. So if one of them is green, then you can easily see it as, as a passing through. And now if I make them so they're colliding, now you can see it's a collision, right? It gets a lot harder, though, when I make them red. Now, the point that I was trying to make before with respect to context dependencies and perception, um, let me make the other dots bigger. Okay. Um, and now I'm going to, I'm going to flick this one around. Um, I'm going to make them bounce. So, um, so now we have a whole bunch of context balls that are um, colliding into each other. And now I'm going to make those target red balls so they're passing through. The empirical phenomena that we obtain psychologically is that it's very likely that human subjects will interpret those red balls as, again, colliding off of each other, bouncing off of each other, because of those contextual balls, right? So people are influenced in this target collision, pass-through event, by what's going on on the outside. Now, um, just here, I just want to see whether you can see this. Um, all right. I just added another object in the display. Um, I made it an invisible object. Um, can anybody say where I put the invisible object? Say where on the screen is the invisible object. Exactly. Yep. So there is an object in the lower center. Um, if you had enough time, you'd be able to identify what shape it is. And this is something that we aspire to be able to do in the model, but it's not able to do it yet. This is something that scientists do willy-nilly all the time. They're positing these latent variables that will make sense of the other events that they're seeing, even though they don't have any direct evidence for, for the collision, right? And so that's why these are heuristic laws, so you're more likely to see a collision if there was an object that you could collide against, but it's not required strictly. So these are all soft constraints that will influence what you'll see. And so people can see collisions, even at least one of the objects is invisible, maybe some scientists, even if they're all invisible. In fact, I guess that's what Maxwell was doing, right? That's where we get um, the uh, thermodynamic um, statistical mechanical understanding of gases is because people are seeing, looking at air and they're seeing collisions, even though all of the air molecules are invisible because they're pretty small, right? Um, okay, so um, just to give um, how am I doing for time, Jurgis? Great, okay. Um, just to give an idea of another kind of heuristic that we would incorporate in, and I'm trying to give you one more example just so you see what our game is like here. And so um, what is this heuristic for attraction? Sometimes we have this notion that one object is attracting another, even if they're not colliding with each other. And our heuristics are going to be that, yeah, you know, A is going to be perceived as attracting B if B is closer to A at time t plus 1 than it was at time t, and if B's trajectory is in the direction of A, 
and more, more to the point, if B's trajectory at time t plus one is a mixture of movement towards A and its previous trajectory at time t, right? And now this is something that we could add or subtract from a human scientist depending upon how smart they were. Right? This was an insight that Newton had, whereby he understood that like, the Earth is being attracted by the sun. And you say, well, why is it being attracted? Why wouldn't it be in, in the sun? Thankfully, it's not. Um, and the answer is because it's attracted, but it had an impulse by itself. So it was going in a particular direction. And where it's going to go is a mixture between going toward the sun and going in the direction that it was already going. But that is quite quite an elaborate insight that not all of our, our humans would have. Um, another part of attraction is that the closest object to A is B and vice versa. Here, we're definitely not in the world of normativity. This isn't what you would put in if you were building an ideal physics model, but it's something that we felt we have to in order to make sense of the psychological data because people are influenced by things like this. Right? This, is, this is definitely descriptive rather than normative, what people do do rather than should do. Um, and another interesting component is that B is pointing to and turning towards A. And with that kind of addition, you can make relatively subtle distinctions between whether A is, is pulling B towards it or whether B is actually approaching A. Right? Which is, seems pretty similar, but see if you see the difference. So in this case, I think we would describe it as B is approaching A. Whereas in this case, we might say that A is pulling B despite B's best intentions. Okay, so, um, so in terms of validation of Ninsun, um, I'm not going to go over a lot of our psychological tests. Um, some of the things that we do is see whether the correspondences that Ninsun sees are similar to the ones that humans have, um, whether it identifies collisions and pass-through events um, like people. Maybe I should actually show you Ninsun. Um, so this is dangerous because uh, this is, I guess, what we would call a live demo. Um, so this is um, Ninsan. Um, and it's built on a dynamic geometry system, um, kind of like geometer sketch pad, um, if you know that. And so I'm just creating a simple world here on the, the right side. Um, I think I'm going to have to say that these are balls. And that's kind of what I mean about um, giving it um, the elementary objects to begin with. I'm going to hide that ball in the middle because it's confusing. I just needed that ball in order to create the circle, which I'm going to designate as a wall. Um, I'm going to give them all an initial impulse because otherwise they would just sit there. And I'm going to move them. So what's going on the right is the world. That's our model of the world. What's going on the left is what we're much more interested in. That's the model of the interpreter, right? So this is the model of what we think the student, for example, is seeing. And you can see the, um, that it has this notion of object permanence. Um, this is all live. I don't know how to, maybe, I don't know whether I'll be able to grab one of these fast enough. Uh, it's hard. So I'm, I'm not going to grab one. But you can see the, from the tracks that the objects are making that it has this notion of persistent objects. And once it has that notion of persistent objects, then it could um, probabilistically come up with this notion of speeds or velocities, or directions of movements, or acceleration, perhaps. Um, and you can also see the relations that it's seeing. When you see um, these little x's that 
occur every now and then. That is the model detecting, thinking it's seeing a pass-through event. So pass-through is one kind of relation between balls. It's kind of a, a non-relation relation, but it, it, for Ninsun, it's thinking of it as a relation. Um, and now, so if I change the world here on the right side, So I'm going to make the balls bounce off of each other now. We'll see on the, so, okay. So now they're bouncing off of each other, and you can see that m more often than not, Ninsun is correctly interpreting them as bouncing off of each other on the left side. And it's showing a bounce representation by the big blue circle. And you can also see that it's noticing um, some of these special bounces are of the gas molecules against the side wall. And it could potentially build up from there this notion of pressure. Um, now, I'm, I'm letting Ninsun uh, here. I'm, I'm going over here so you can see that I'm not doing anything anymore. Um, and so we might be seeing Ninsun um, modifying the world on its own. Oh, okay, thanks, great. So, um, so I've put Ninsun in the, the scientist mode where it's going to be coming up with conjectures here that you won't be able to see that could be related to accelerations or velocities, directions, relative positions. I don't know what it's going to be about, but it's going to be making conjectures here and then Oh, there you go. So, and then it's going to be modifying the world in order to try to gain evidence about these conjectures that it's contemplating. So this is what we think is an important part of what scientists do, is, is you know, test their predictions, test the laws that they're developing against empirical data by varying parameters of the system. Um, okay, so, so, so that is, So, yeah, and if you actually can read that, you'll see that it's entertaining some ideas about um, pass-throughs and, and collisions and, and perimeters. So there, it's entertaining some different possibilities there. Um, so, okay, so going back to like, how do we test to see whether we have a good model ourselves? Um, so we do test um, this against humans in various capacities, the probability is of them making different interventions and comparing it to the interventions that people make. The thing that I really wanted to stress is this notion of context dependencies of motion correspondences, so that I didn't actually show you that in Ninsun, but Ninsun can be biased in terms of its neural networks to see an ambiguous event as either a pass-through or a collision depending upon the others. And it's that kind of data which makes us, we believe, justified in not going the world of Bacon and not having a high-level symbolic starting place, but having a much more grounded perceptual representation. Because we're saying that what you're taking as given, that you have a collision, is, is not given always. That it is a matter of interpretation and perspective. So for us, we think that we empirically have evidence um, that people have this bi-directional influences, that the object correspondences that you're seeing influence whether you'll see any given thing as a collision or a pass-through, and vice versa. If you see a lot of collisions, that's going to be influencing your object correspondences. So I don't really want to enter the game of Bacon and like count number of laws discovered, um, because Bacon will win. Um, but we, we have discovered um, some of the, I guess, um, special cases of the ideal gas law as PV equals NRT, in addition to um, um, like Boyle's law, Charles' law. Um, pedagogically, I think we're um, very interested in trying to use Ninsun as a critique of um, models of computer simulations that are being used in, in actual student context. Um, one that I'll show is my collaborator um, a 
colleague, I guess, of Michael Glansberg, Uri Walensky at Northwestern, has developed the system NetLogo, which is a way of creating computational models for student learning. Um, and this is their original version of an ideal gas law. Um, it'll look a lot like what you just saw with NINSUN. Um, and we fed in this original model that they had um, into NINSUN, and we saw that NINSUN was very oftentimes misinterpreting sort of, in some ways, the big point of this as an ideal gas law simulation. Um, one of the things that they did, maybe you can see it, is that they use color coding to show the, the speed, which is related to the kinetic energy of the individual molecules. So the fast ones are going red, um, the medium ones are going green, the slow ones are going blue. Um, but this actually hurt Ninsun's ability to detect object correspondences because color is one of the cues that is used in Ninsun to say that you've got the same object. And th this may seem kind of trivial, but um, how do I put this? So Ninsun and, as it turns out, human subjects, children, um, are very likely when they're given this version of the simulation that Uri and his colleagues use, they're likely to think that there's objects that are spontaneously coming into and out of existence. Like they'll say, oh, look, that green object and that blue object uh, made babies and it was a red baby. And, right? and, so, and that's because there was nothing red before and now there's something which is red. right? And, and that's a real problem because I should say that the ideal gas laws are conservation laws. They only apply when you have a fixed number of molecules in this containing vessel. And they're critically important that it's a conservation law, that you're um, neither creating or destroying kinetic energy, which is going to be related to a, a square function of the, the, the speed, right? So on this basis, um, so we're, we first off, when we were modifying this model, we got rid of the, the speed coding. So each object has its own um, color, which helps you in the object correspondence world. We um, put on tracing so you can follow individual molecules. So you can see one object and the path that it's making. And the thing that helps a lot as probably will not surprise you, but came out of Ninsun, is if you actually want people, like students, to end up with something like the ideal gas laws to emphasize certain collisions over others. So what I've done here is I've got it every time there is a collision of the molecules against the side walls, then it's brought to the, the human's attention. And this helped Ninsun a lot for prioritizing pressure as a derived perceptual notion. And as it turns out, it helps children a lot too. So that's where we're sort of going in terms of um, uh, creating a quality assurance uh, method automatically for, for simulations that you might want to inflict on, on students. Um, okay, I think I'm pretty much ready to um, wrap up now, um, and I guess I'm going to wrap up in in a way that will also point towards other projects that we're engaged in. So maybe one way of framing what we're trying to do is we're trying to think about um, education um, as so achieved by training students to have better perception and action routines. Perception and action routines that will allow them to, to transfer their knowledge from one situation, ideally, to another situation. Um, and um, I'm just going to quickly shout out our, our work on, on math in this. So we've developed um, a, a mathematics tutoring system which is based upon the idea of letting students um, manipulate the components of a math equation very much like they would be manipulating regular objects in their world. So um, we're trying to get students to 
for example, learned to conduct algebra by, by making legitimate, mathematically valid transformations. Um, so you can move the eight to the other side of the x because of commutativity of multiplication. But we have this idea of objects at multiple size scales. So you can take this entire negative x8 and you can move it to the other side of the y. In a very controversial move, we also allow it to be moved to the other side of the equation, okay? Right, a big part of what we're interested in is, is connections between representations. So we're very interested in, um, oops, I didn't mean to do that, is taking an equation and allowing people to scrub it in both directions. So as you move this up and down, you can see how it changes the underlying equation, or if you change the equation, you can see how it changes the, the resulting graph. Right. So we're trying to, um, I guess in some ways, deflate what might be considered abstract reasoning into trained perception action routines. Um, and so we think that this can, one big application going along with Uri Walensi's work is trying to train in perceptual biases so that people will interpret systems in a decentralized rather than centralized way, rather than thinking that the, the um, the seagull in front of the pack is the leader of the pack, thinking of it as a decentralized system instead, where the leaders are actually taking turns. Um, so a large part of what we're interested in psychologically is figuring out what kinds of perceptual grounding are worth fighting for, or do we want to include in our simulations. Um, I'm, uh, sort of um, idealizing over a lot of work we've done. Um, uh, but my generalization will be um, spatial relations are good to put in simulations. Um, forces, people think in terms of forces. Definitely this notion of interpreted objects, which was, you know, core to what Thomas Kuhn was getting at and what we're trying to get at. Um, but there's various kinds of extra kind of grounding that we've put in from time to time, and almost invariably that's been negative. Things like extra graphical detail, uh, narrative detail, have actually been shown to, by us and by David Utah, Judy Deloche, a lot of other people's, um, Jennifer Kaminsky, Slutsky, um, not to be very useful. So I'm not trying to say the richer the better, far, far from it but um, we're trying to figure out what kinds of perceptual representations are worth putting in. Um, so the kinds of things that I think scientists and the kind of models that Michael was talking about before that we're putting into NINSUN are things like these uh, grounded spatial physical processes like attraction and repulsion, activation and inhibition, pushing and pulling, carrying and dropping. Um, and so within this world, um, what we're trying to get at is this idea that maybe you can achieve transfer um, from like billiard balls to ideal gases, um, not by training people in their mathematical formalisms directly, but rather by trying to train their perceptual systems so they'll naturally interpret the world in one way. And so my analogy that I'm borrowing from Leeper from the 1930s is that um, if you show people at an ambiguous man-rat picture, but you've preceded it by an unambiguous rat picture, they'll see it as a rat. Whereas if you had preceded that ambiguous picture by an uh, unambiguous picture of a man, then they will interpret that same picture as a man. I'm taking that as a case of transfer. People do not usually think of that as transfer, but I think it would be a really good model for how we might be able to have sort of real politic kinds of transfer of student knowledge um, in these kind of computer simulation situations. All right, so that's a great place to end. Thanks very much. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot. So we have time for questions, comments, or before going to reception, before drinking some wine. Any questions? Any? Jeff. 
So, Rob, thanks for that very cool talk. Um, so I was perseverating on the, um, on the motion to stable objects to motion uh, because in the, the case of that, you know, a phi motion is a weird case. And in natural motion, you don't have to solve a correspondence problem in the visual, you know, and the visual system mostly doesn't, right? So we can perceive perfectly good velocity in like a flowing stream or sand rolling off a dune without objects and the visual system does it because of these passing up of uh, uh, basically temporal differential signals up to MT without, that largely bypasses the ventral system. So I don't think that this is central at all to the thing, but I just wondered if you think that that kind of motion pathway is at all important for doing this kind of physical reasoning. Making has also been made by Gibson, for example, is that the real world may not be as ambiguous as I've made out, that there may be an overdetermination of motion. And in some cases, you might not even require individuation in for objects in order to see the motion. I, I'm, I buy that. I think that. I think that's true. I think it's um, in the case of our computer simulations that we want our students to learn it is more of this object-based motion because they are these quite clean cut divisible objects and so and yeah i mean i mean the other thing of what you were saying is i treat this not as i'm um, sort of a conscious interpreted um veneer over the perceptual system i think of this as being done by the perceptual visual system. Um, in, so in some ways, I guess that's why I like the example of object motion because I completely buy the neuroscience story that, um, that there is dedicated machinery, like MT, for doing motion processing. And so in some ways, what we're trying to say is that even in the case where there's dedicated brain machinery, that doesn't mean that there's not these contextually defined influences. So what we're trying to do in some ways is to reconcile this notion of modularity in visual processing with this notion of context dependencies or top-down feedback, or in this case, uh, influences of other object motions on a specific object motion. Yeah, so one other thing, I, I, I forgot to say, which is totally important, which is I think that those kind of computations are actually totally critical for handling occlusion and attention lapses, mm -hmm. and which are necessary for doing the kind of reasoning. So, so yeah, yeah, so that. Yeah, and right. And so attention is a big part of this, and we've only begun to crack that nut. Um, so it turns out for or for people shown um, ideal gas law simulations, they're really only able to track, you know, two or three motions in order to figure out whether the objects are colliding or bouncing off of each other. They feel like they're seeing it all, but they're really not. And to work these out seems to require sort of the kind of um, pollution kinds of tracking operations that, that, that you know about. So, yeah, so that, so I think that's an important insight that uh, the perceptual interpretation has to work hand in hand with the, the sort of spotlight of attention to, to allocate attention just to the things that you're really interested in finding out whether they're bouncing or colliding. Okay, James. Thanks, that was a great talk. I'm, I'm wondering, do you have a way of um, modeling the, the distinction between, let's say, occlusion uh, and then uh, fusion or mixing? Um, so, just in terms of the, um, I was just thinking of the um, experiments that uh, Ilga and, and, and team were, were, do, were doing uh, and presenting earlier today. The, the spatial model you need in order to actually model properly, uh, occluding circles, regions for each other, of course, you have to have two planes, right? You have to, ha you, have, you really do have to have uh, just a little bitty slice of, of an additional depth dimensionality. Right. 
Um, right. But you yeah, don't... no, I think that's a great question. Oh, I was going to try to show this. Uh... Oh, I'm not sure I'm going to be able to bring this up right here. Um, so one of the interesting things about the demonstration I was showing before is um, people don't actually have trouble violating this two-to-one mapping constraint. Oh. oh, yeah, great. Oh, no, that's not exactly what I want. Oh, I, I broke it. Um, <laughs> I'll, I'll have to try to describe it. So if I had two objects in one frame and a single object in another frame, then people would interpret it as occlusion or fusing of these two objects. So they, you'd see it as sort of um, a fusing together, a splitting apart, a fusing together and splitting apart. But as soon as I put in that second object and you have a way of interpreting it so that you'd have one-to-one -one assignments, mm. people, that is such a strong bias that people can't go back and interpret this situation that I originally had like that. So you might say, and you might be, you could give this to yourself as a task, you, oh, um, I don't know why you're not seeing what I'm seeing. Um, are you, oh, I see. Uh, huh. Um, <laughs> let me, that's, that's interesting. How long have you not been seeing what I've been seeing? Just, just now. Just now, okay. <laughs> so, so, so an exercise for you, somebody's going to say that they can do this. Um, um, so try to see the lower right hand object as blinking on and off, whereas the the other objects are splitting and fusing mm -hmm. to become the upper left hand object. Mm -hmm. And that is like almost impossible to do. Whereas if you take your thumb and you just hide that lower right hand object, then I'm going to maintain that some of you will be able to see that splitting and fusing thing that I was talking about before. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So if you can't create a one to one mapping, then you'll be okay with a two-to-one mapping. But as soon as you can see it in a one-to-one -one manner, like you have enough objects in each of the frames, then it's, it's sort of imperative by the system because, because, uh, because Jurgis is not spontaneously combusting, basically. <laughs> well, although he did, oh no, there he uh, he, Wow, that was amazing. Right it's, it, it's the same Jurgis, though. Thank you. <laughs> So, any other questions, comments, or anything? So, if there are no questions, no comments, then uh, let's thank our speaker again. <laughs> and before before we are heading to the reception, which is next in the next room, let's uh, say thank uh, some uh, warm thanks to Rob. Okay, so, so there is some wine and uh, some snacks in the next room, so you're welcome to have some coffee and...